is this okay okay good so i'm going to talk about so my title is thoughts about me searching neurodiversity and entrepreneurship so i'm going to talk very much about not findings but more about uh doing this kind of research and i'm going to return to this term me search quite a bit it's a term i really like and uh yeah that's essentially what we're going to center around and um please please interrupt i mean i i'm a person who learn mostly through dialogue i'm very i'm a very bad listener <laughs> and i also i know i know that other people like me so please interrupt and you know you can, you can you can ask you can just ask questions outright or if uh, if you ask him in the chat oana has promised that she's going to read them out to me so it, it's either way works fine and um i'm also going to have like three q and a places where we're going to stop for a bit for, for more general q and a at this at the end of each of my uh sections but you know just ask them whenever you feel that you want to ask something or give any kind of comment so overview i'm i'm going to talk um about my own me search as an as a point of departure for or an illustration of the points i want to make rather and um um and then i'm going to talk about why this me search leads to <clears throat> the most relevant research um and um and then if we get the time what entrepreneurship scholars can teach clinical psychologists about ADHD i know that's a pretty brave uh, uh point but i actually do believe i'm working with clinical psychologists outstanding scholars but they actually agree that we can teach them something and that's very much because we're using this me search approach and then like i said q and a after each section so my goal is to inspire you to explore new fields of research i do believe that's very much in line with what the spring institute is trying to do um and more specifically i mean i'm an entrepreneurship scholar if you do research in other areas like organization studies or gender issues or whatever that's perfectly fine i just don't know very much about that I'm, so i'm thinking about the intersection of disability and entrepreneurship specifically but i think it would be relevant for you even if you don't care much about uh entrepreneurship as long as you care about disability that is um uh, i i would argue that either anika or oana could very well have done this presentation uh i think they might have done it much more eloquently than i will do uh but i think we don't really we haven't really worked together so far but i would say we very much work in parallel right we do similar things we have similar thoughts so you know whatever they do you can think about that as an illustration of how i think you guys should go about your work and the nature of my slides i'm showing slides i always do uh they're very boring if you uh, if you can't see them or you don't want to look at them don't i mean it's essentially for my own memory so it's just pointers to myself so there's nothing in the slides that you can't get from just listening to me and as i said please feel free to interrupt whenever um whenever you feel a need to do so all right so i'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, where i come from uh in this uh when it comes to uh the me search so as you may know i love this quotation good decisions come from experience and experience comes from making bad decisions i think that's very true for me i think it's true for everyone so what i'm going to tell you now it's it's going to be a very nice story uh that sounds like i did everything right uh of course that's not true i made many mistakes but this is like the things that i that i remember it's a good thing that we have have cognitive bias and only remember the good things but anyway so this is going to sound a lot more straightforward than it probably was uh so how it started so i i had a exact a decade ago now i had some mental health challenges and um i would say that this changed my my life um in many many ways and it certainly changed my research too so um, among other things i i was diagnosed with adhd and something i thought a lot about um is and i still do is am i successful despite or thanks to adhd and i'm 
I think I, I view myself as a reasonable, successful guy. I've been married for 35 years. I have two great kids. I have, have a nice house. I have good friends. I have, I have, I have a good job, you know? So I'm, I think I've done, done pretty okay in life. And I've been thinking is that despite the, this fact, because as you know, ADHD is considered a disability. And the question, if it is a disability by definition, it should lead to all these kinds of problems, but I don't think it necessarily does that. I think that for me, it's been both uh, a handicap and an asset, but it completely depends on the context. Sometimes I feel that it's been something that's been serving me very well, but I also know that in other situations, there are stuff that I'm not able to do or not doing as well as other people. So that's, that's where it all started. And then I saw a parallel between my life and entrepreneurship. I mean, as a scholar, I can do very much what I enjoy doing. I can do it when I like to do it. I can work it in the middle of the night and sleep during the day, for example. And entrepreneurship is a bit the same way. And also, I think that a lot of these traits of being very action-oriented and not very planning could potentially serve entrepreneurs well. So that's essential. I, I just intuitively felt there might be a parallel here. And uh, yeah, so could, could ADHD be an asset in entrepreneurship? And what I did was I, <clears throat> I went to the website for my own university. I'm in Syracuse University in upstate New York. And we have a school, a, a department of psychology. And it so happened that there's a, one person there who's a full professor specializing in ADHD. So I sent him, I sent him an email and said, can I take you to lunch? I have something I'd like to ask you. And he said, sure. So we went to lunch and I essentially just asked, do you think, is this, am I completely crazy to think that there might be a positive link between entrepreneurship and ADHD? And as opposed to me, Kevin, as his name is, he's a thoughtful guy. So he didn't, he didn't answer right away he gave it a few minutes and then it says yeah i actually think you might be onto something so for me that was very encouraging that somebody from the field of uh clinical psychology thought that there might be something to to your thinking here so then the next thing i i, I did was that i i kind of floated this idea about entrepreneurship and adhd and packaged in different ways sometimes i just spoke more about entrepreneurship and disability, sometimes more about entrepreneurship and neurodiversity. Uh, so slight, I, I kind of framed it slightly different, but I, I floated it on multiple platforms. For example, I was able to get interviewed in, in media. I gave a lot of presentations to the general public. Uh, I, uh, yeah. And I, I got some positive response. I mean, um, far from everybody thought this is, is interesting. Far from everybody thought it was worthwhile, but there were enough people that thought that, well, maybe you're onto something that I felt at least somewhat encouraged. And then I interviewed 20, I was able through a support organization to um, get, a, uh, get in contact with 25 entrepreneurs who have various psychiatric diagnoses. So I just spoke to them about their life as entrepreneurs. And I felt that was very rewarding. And I wrote a paper about this. And when I presented that paper at the Babson conference a couple of years later, uh, that was actually uh, in London, Ontario, Oana, so that was in, on your home tour. Actually, I had a full room of people. So then I realized that, hey, there seems to be some scholars who think this is interesting. And I bet you at least half of the people were there because they themselves identified with some kind of neurodiverse uh, condition, whether that's ADHD or uh, something else I don't know. But anyway, so I wrote the paper. I started writing a research agenda paper. It took probably three years before that was done like, because I just felt so much that I need to kind of state to people why this is important. I also started thinking about just teasing out conceptually how are these kind of, uh, let's call them diagnosis related to entrepreneurship. So I, I did this for my own sake very much just to sort out my thinking. And then I just realized uh, what I want to do with this is I just want to get as many people as possible to realize that this is important research and get as many as people as possible on board, so to say. So that's largely how I went about it. Any questions? 
I mean, I guess this is not too far from from you, Annika. Is it? You, you can see the parallel, I guess. You are mute. I can't hear you. Sorry, I double clicked. Um, no, absolutely. With kind of similar way I got into this field yeah. as well. Good. Yeah, I, I can see that. I think it's, this, I mean, this is not rocket science. And I just want to tell you what, what, what I've done today. Then I'm not doing this to, maybe I'm doing this to impress you. I hope that's not why, but I just think it's, it, it kind of tells you a little bit, yeah, the, the things I've done and, and also what, a bit what I think it takes. I never say no to a presentation. I never ask for money. I mean, uh, like today, I mean, I, I would have loved being out on my skis, but uh, when Annika and Juan asked me, I said, of course, I want to be involved in this. So, I mean, I, I always, I give a lot of presentations. I've kept writing articles. I, I think I'm, I'm up to 14 now. Um, I, I will continue to do that for the rest of my career. I've organized a lot of workshops like you guys are doing here. I think it's a great way of getting more people on board. I've done I've been, I've been doing it every, uh, together with, with the staff, and I was here yesterday. I proposed one as, for this year as well at the Academy of Management. So I've, I've done um, I've done eight. Hopefully, I'm doing two more this year if everything goes goes well. So I think it's a great way of kind of getting people together. And every time, more and more people come. That's a great thing. We, there were 80 people last time. We're hoping for over 100 this year. Like you guys did, I know you've done a special issue for for Journal of Business Ethics. Same thing, I've organized three special issues in in, in journals. And um, I've been in the media. I mean, I've, I've tried to, if, if a journalist calls me, I, I'm always, it's like being invited to presentations. I think it's really important to get the word out to bigger audience. And it's also a good way of connecting to entrepreneurs. So I'm trying to do a lot of, lot of stuff. Um, and of course, if we look at well, what's, what's the purpose of all this, I really, really think this building a, a community of scholars is, is, is so important to get more people on board and, and also people from different backgrounds who come at this from different angles. Um, so that's what we do, I think, through the, the, uh, uh, the workshops, through the special issues. And then part of, of writing these papers the whole time is to kind of legitimize and also organizing the special issues is to or legitimize this new field of research on the intersection of entrepreneurship and clinical psychology. And this is also why I want the clinical psychologists to be involved. Just so, um, yeah, people can feel other, you know, younger people, um, let's say PhD students and other can feel I can do I can actually build a career in this area because it's now a legitimate field. So I think that's important. I think it's important to create this infrastructure of, of uh, that's why I want to do these workshops at the Academy of Management every year. So people feel that if they do research, they're somewhere where they can actually, actually present it. Of course, spreading the word. I think at the end of the day, I don't know to what extent you're doing this, Annika and Oana, but I think it's really important to link this to education. At the end of the day, I think that our research has to uh, communicate with our our education. At the end of the day, as a university professor, that's what we do. We do research and then we apply that in our teaching. So, so that's uh, something important. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, we, we, we need external funding in order to do our research. That's another thing that I think is, is important. And it's not only about, of course, me getting money, but it's about everybody else who's in this sphere to be able to raise. I think that's what, um, that's what, uh, what I'm aiming for, so to say. And then I just want to show you, I'm, because I'm working on a review now, actually, uh, so this is just to see, we, we just found, I think it was 54 papers on entrepreneurship and ADHD uh, articles published in the journals. And as you can see, it, it, was, it was very few in the beginning, but as you can see, it, it, it keeps increasing. And I think there's actually 16 published articles in 2021. So it's, I would say it's working. You know, more and more people are, are uh, finding this as an interesting area of research. And as I said, it's not only me. I think we're, we're pretty good at building a, a community of scholars. There's a lot of other people involved here.
so that that's my background how i came, came at this so please any kind of questions or comments um, this could be a good time before i switch to the next topic Wanting for hands. I know you have questions for Johan. Yeah. No hands. <laughs> All right. And um, I, I think there is a hand. At least my computer says so. Yes. Yes, Ariel, you just came I, yeah. through. <laughs> Hi, Johan. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you know, a question that we asked, I asked yesterday too, and I think is relevant. I know we've discussed this before, but it might be really helpful for the audience of junior faculty and junior scholars here um, in this panel. But, um, you know, you've seen this success, and I think that that's wonderful that you've seen this increase in publications on this topic. Um, can you talk a little bit about pushback that reviewers or other me members of the academy gave regarding this topic and how you overcame those pushbacks in order to continue to pursue a research agenda that may seem yeah. untraditional or, in, or unconventional yeah i mean i think the the one that i'm kind of struggling with is when i say with because this runs counter to of course clinical psychology when i'm saying that uh, ADHD may be functional in entrepreneurship. Not only might people with ADHD be, be attracted to entrepreneurship, but their actual traits might actually convey some uh, advantages. And that focus specifically, this is what I found in my interviews, I'm focused specifically on impulsivity. And as you know, uh, everybody pretty much approaches entrepreneurship as some kind of reasoned action. You know, it's more or less rational, even if you if you use, you know, effectuation or something like that at the end of the day it, it's very much based on recent action and we're saying well actually there might be this more bottom-up that's it, it's like in, impulses drive be, drives action and not deliberation and that might be functional yeah i mean so what what we've done there is there's a group of us i mean we talk a lot of internally and then we just write papers and try to get them published um, Dan Lerner and, and Rick Hunt have been the most, I, I have not been successful. I have one paper, one in AMP. They have two in three papers in JBB. Uh, one came out last week. And, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a matter of, of, you know, using the, first of all, I mean, I think it's, it's, you use the traditional means, you know, you try to carve out your arguments as, as best you can. And submit it to the journals and then you can always organize uh, your own special issues you know uh, when we did that with amp uh, i was very lucky because uh, phil fan uh, identifies with adhd he was the editor so he said of course uh, it's something that i'm interested in for the same reason as you're interested so he let us do that special issue which was very very helpful um yeah, so I think it's it, it's this gradual process of, um, but then it's also I think by getting more and more people on board, uh, you know, you get more. I mean, there's this guy. His his name is um, uh, uh, Russell Barkley. He's the most cited person in entrepreneur in ADHD research. When he and I first started chatting, he was completely against anything I did done. But I've been chatting with him now for two years. I'm hoping he's going to be part of this review article we're writing. I mean, so yeah, I'm trying to get, I mean, also the, the paper that um, Dan Lerner published now, uh, he had a couple of clinical psychologists as part of that team. I think it's those two things in parallel, try to get big, the big names involved. And then at the same time, you know, try to convince the journals and maybe the special issues first, but then also just, you know, submit papers. I'm not sure if it's if it's a good answer, but that's that's what we've done. No, I think that's great, Johan, because again, you know, we have such passion in this space. And I know I'm not alone in saying that, but also not alone in being told, well, you know, is that a management question? Is that, you know, a business yeah. question? Is a Absolutely. lot of the pushback I personally get. So to hear how you have overcome that and kept going is so but helpful. This is because this is so good because it's actually, I mean, 
I'll, I'll continue with my next slide because this, because the pushback I've been getting is that, okay, Johan, I'm sure you're getting this as well, Annika and Ariel and others. It's like, oh yeah, of course I understand that for you, this is important because you identify, but I mean, nobody else gives a shit. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is like marginal research. Why don't you do something about venture capital? That's real research. And I've actually, I wrote, I wrote a piece that touches upon this. And my argument is actually absolutely opposite. I'm saying this is the most relevant research you can do. And not only is it relevant for you as a person, I think it's the most relevant research for the whole field. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the next, whatever, 20 minutes or so. But we have a question from Alex there. <laughs> Let me turn on my camera and everything. Um, what you're talking about sort of the, the relevance, um, what are the theoretical implications? Because I think there's some very interesting theoretical implications of uh, neurotypicality and neuroatypicality um, as they relate to structure, or as you, you, you mentioned, this idea of impulsivity. And so that brings into question, um, I think, how we understand agency um, and reflexivity. Um, and so it seems like there are if, if it doesn't, if, if these questions don't necessarily speak to the strategy type entrepreneurship people, why aren't you researching venture capital? Yeah. You know, as somebody who has a more of a sociological background, uh, like I see these as being sort of like really, you know, not only fundamental, but a good opportunity for entrepreneurship to contribute back and help explore these, these, you know, sort of these fundamental ideas. And yeah. so with all that said, um, has the pushback against this primarily been from the more strategy entrepreneurship people versus the more OT entrepreneurship people in terms of relevance? Great question. Um, so, so, so I think that, I think we can have so many different, um, impacts using so many different perspectives like i saw in your special issue there in journal of business ethics i saw that you were there were a lot of topics you had that i don't know anything about i mean you you frame things in terms of uh, you were i can't remember what you were talking about but for example you talk about reflexivity i'm familiar with the term there's a lot of people in sweden where i'm from who use that kind of approach to research I don't know anything about it. I'm sure it could be very, very useful. No, I mean, I, I think that in my own case, um, you know, I've been working quite a bit now with, we can call it entrepreneurship action theory. I don't know if it means anything to you, but it's, it's largely this idea that entrepreneurship is defined as action under uncertainty. And then people have dealt with this in many different ways. There are these people that lean towards an Austrian approach, like uh, I'm going to mention some names like Foss and Klein are two people, or Per Bialand is the third one. There are those that are more like something called effectuation, which is Sarasvati. There are those that are talking maybe more about resourcefulness approaches and so forth. So that's the conversation we're engaging with largely. Uh, and we have those other people we're getting pushback from. We also got a pushback from um, more of the clinical side, I guess, where people say, some people say we're taking things too lightly, um, where we're, uh, we're looking at things that are serious mental disorders, and we're kind of talking about them as potentially being an advantage. We're not really serious enough about how big of a, of a challenge this can be for people. And my response to that is usually just that, well, we have about 10,000 papers written in that vein. If I write one paper or two papers that presents a slightly different view, is it me who being uh, unbalanced or is it the 10,000 other papers that are unbalanced? So that's been my response to that side. But I would say more generally, I mean, the, 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 the the protest or whatever, the, the opposition comes from traditionalists, I would say. Uh, I would say people that lean on very established theories and established methods. As you know, there are people who are more eclectic in, in all fields, and I think that they kind of take more easily to these things. And then we all have the whole thing about self-identification. I think that the, the idea is that 
that Annika and Oana present, the ideas that I present, if you have any kind of experience that resonates with what we're saying, I think it's just intuitively makes sense. You know what I mean? So I think that's another angle of kind of getting people on board. So many of the people who do research in my space have ADHD or some similar diagnosis themselves. So um, I'm not sure if that's a good answer, but I, I did my best. Thank you. Okay, so, so but like like Alex was was talking about why, you know, what, what the pushback we get, and and actually I've written about this because I, I thought it, it, it is important that we don't just do navel gazing as some people call it that we actually can show that the research we do is uh, relevant, and, and um, so this is essentially why relevance is necessary and why I think me search is the best way forward. And then how you know if it works. So those are like the three themes here. But and this builds loosely onto uh, onto um, editorials I wrote for ETP. This first one came out in 2019. It's called Conquering Relevance. I wrote that with Mike Wright, who's no longer among us, and Checker Zara. And uh, the other one is is based on this. I wrote, uh, it's about me search. It, I wrote that with Dean Shepard and Dean Modimo. And so, um, um, yeah, what I'm talking about now are like, they're not exactly the same as in the papers because, you know, if, if you write papers with other people, you, you, you always have negotiate what goes in and what doesn't go into the papers. But these are my main contributions to those two papers that I'll talk about now. So, I mean, the first thing is that I, I think that it goes without saying. I think that, that relevance is it's necessary. I mean, it's um, and essentially, if we got to realize if we don't do research that adds value to somebody, if we've been taken away from us, we're not going to no longer be being a, uh, allowed to do our research, and that that's happening all around us. I'm just going to give you an example. I think this is kind of fun, Ariel to look at why there is strong pressure for deans to not let people do research, but to hire full-time teaching faculty instead. So if you just look at, uh, it's, that's, it's economics. So essentially, at my own institution, if you include summer support, I mean, a starting salary is close to $200,000, which is ridiculously amount of money if you're a tenure track, and they teach three classes per year. If you're a professor of practice, you are less than half and teach twi twice as much. So essentially our dean gets eight times more money or eight times more teaching out of every dollar he spends on salaries if he hires a professor of practice versus uh, somebody who does research. And I mean, we're a private university. And so at the end of the day, we're gonna make, uh, uh, we're gonna make a profit or at least we, we, we can't run at a loss. So there are extremely strong incentives for for business schools and universities to not let their faculty do research. That's essentially my whole point. So we must provide some kind of kind of value, and whether we do or not, I mean that's that's completely subjective. But somebody must feel that. Oh, look at all that research they're doing now at whichever university you're at. That's really cool. And the question is, do we do this? And if, if you follow the debate, I'm going to show you some slides now that are not important, but essentially they all show the same idea that there's a lot of people who think that our research does not add value. That's essentially what the next six slides are going to show you. So, I mean, this is this Rockman School of Management, which is down the street from where you are, Oana. Uh, he said this in 2015 that he, he predicted that if we don't take action, we will lose 90% of all our tenure track uh, positions within five years. Essentially, the vast majority will become full-time teachers in business schools. That's a very, and if we look, this is, I'm just gonna say, this is a book somebody wrote, and it actually shows that in, in my country, the US, these days, 75% of all new hires across all disciplines are full-time teachers with no research. So 75% of all new hires in America are off the tenure track, they, they are full-time teachers. So it's already happening, right? And here's another example that from Financial Times. It, it's one of the ministers in the UK who said that business schools should do more teaching and less research. So, you know, there are people from all <laughs> in all places saying that 
you know, uh, maybe we shouldn't do all that research. And here we have some guys from Harvard saying that, well, we have lost our ways. We do research that's completely useless. And here's somebody from London Business, London Business School says, well, it's not only use. That's it's actually, it's destroying our research is destroying management practice. It, it's it's a bad thing, uh, the research we do. So just to, illust- to illustrate that, you know, there's a lot of people who are saying that what we're doing at the business schools in terms of research is not that great, essentially. That That's the whole point. And they're saying that, well, maybe we shouldn't do do research because, because of this. So that's, I'm not going to suggest to you why this approach, uh, which I call me search, why I think that works. So, um, and I mean, it's not about following your passion. It, it's much more than that, because I think stating to follow your passion is trivial. So it's not, passion is important, but it's way more than, than following your passion. When I talk about me search and so, um, so just take an example. I, I met people who say, uh, you know, I do research that's relevant. I asked them, what do you do? And they might say, well, I'm doing research on artificial intelligence. I'm doing research now on COVID. And they said, because I'm doing this research, you know, that everybody's talking about in the world, of course, my research is relevant. These are hot topics, right? And, and my question is all always, you know, um, who is it relevant for? And then they say, well, it's relevant maybe for, I don't know, entrepreneurs or policymakers or whatever they might answer. Um, so essentially I'm asking, you know, who are your stakeholders? And then to say it, it's important for entrepreneurs. My question is, can you reach them? Do you actually communicate with these people? And nine times out of 10, the people say they do this relevant research. They don't really communicate with those that are the stakeholders. And then I'm like, do you think that entrepreneurs really read journal of business venturing? And the answer, as you know, on is no, they don't. Uh, one as an editor for, for JVD. I mean, they don't read EDP either. So it's like just doing research and publishing it in journal doesn't mean that uh, you reach anybody who you claim is benefited from your research. And I think that's a real thing we need to take very seriously. And the other thing is, you know, even, if, you know, we might do organized workshops and, and we might go and give talks and stuff. But, but the thing is that you got to be able to argue why they're supposed to come and listen to you because as you know there's extreme competition for attention i mean there's a lot of people talking for example about artificial intelligence and COVID and what it does for entrepreneurs um some people are scholars of course but there's a lot of other people so it's it, it's hard to it's hard to break through and i think this is you know most people i talk to this is the kind of conversations i get into often they are criticizing me for not being being relevant. And those are kind of the questions I asked to them in return. So I, but this is what I think is, is, is wrong with, with the approach most people take to relevance. I think it's, they're talking to too broad and vague of an audience, you know, just saying, okay, this is important to policymakers or this is important to entrepreneurs. I, I, I don't think that that works. And most importantly, it, uh, it's kind of fun because I work at a business school and my colleagues do marketing and they say, you know, in order for marketing to be successful, you need to make an emotional connection. I mean, you can just look at any ad for any car these days. They don't mention a single fact about the actual vehicle. It's all about the emotions they try to uh, evoke uh, among the audiences. And we typically don't do that when we do our research, try to connect on an emotional level. So uh, at the end of the day, I think there are too few people who really care about most research. And therefore, I think that um, irrespective of how how relevant the potential be, I don't think it is relevant. And also, we have this top down instead of a bottom up approach. And I will get to what I mean by that in just a second. So this is what I think is And I I share this before I started doing this more me search oriented research. I think I was a great example of this. I wrote a a section at the end of my paper saying why this was relevant to entrepreneurs. But when I wrote that section, I knew no entrepreneur would ever read that text. So it's just something I did. I I, I kind of knew it wasn't. Yeah, I knew, knew I didn't really connect with them. 
But anyway, I think that, so this is a simple three by three matrix here about how many people care about research and how much they care. And I guess ideally we want to be in that quadrant there where there's many people who care a lot about our research, right? That's, that's the ideal situation. But I think a lot of people, they, like I say, they speak to a very vague and say entrepreneurs in general or policymakers in general should care about my research, at least a little bit. It might not be the most important thing in their lives, but they should care a bit about it. I don't think that's a good strategy. I think we should aim for this, that get a few people to care a lot about what you do. That's how I think you can uh, make relevant research. I give you, if you get one single person, one single gazillionaire, if you can get, let, I'm going to give an example. If you can get Elon Musk to agree that entrepreneurship about autism and uh, entrepreneurship is the greatest thing ever, and he gives, let's say, $50 million to do that kind of research, you only need one supporter, right? So I think it's better to have this approach, to have a few people care a lot about our research. So that's why I think this me search works. So essentially, what I mean mean by this me search is, you know, you do research that's very relevant to yourself. So then, you know, there's one person who cares, you know? One is better than zero. So at least you as an individual care deeply about what you do. I think that's the starting point. So it's essentially what, what do you care deeply about? Ask that question to yourself. And then seek associations to entrepreneurship research. Or if you are in a, you know, if you do gender research or if you, you do organization theory or whatever it is you do, just seek associations between the thing you care deeply about. I mean, I'm going to give you an example. There's a guy called Greg Fisher. He's an outstanding scholar in Indiana. He and I share one thing in common. We love cycling. Okay. We, and so he went on this um, race across South Africa. So he was on the road for about two months riding his mountain bike from one end of South Africa to the other end. And he's now written a paper about that. And he's hope he's it's, he presented it last week here in Syracuse. It's a great paper. He's aiming to get that into one of the top management uh, papers, excuse me, management journals. Um, there's another, yeah, there are other people doing this. But anyway, so it doesn't matter if you care deeply about disability or if you care deeply about cycling or anything else. Try, you know, start with this thing and then just seek the association to your research area. And you can do that in many different ways, I think. Um, so it's essential building these connections between your life and, and your research. And um, and then you just seek buy-in from others, one person at a time. And you can do that by organizing these kind of workshops that we're, we're at, taking part in right now. Um, or you can do that like Greg, you can tell me about it because I care about cycling. He told me about his research. Uh, we, and hopefully we can go on a bike ride together. He can tell me more about it. So, you know, um, and then you build from there. So I think it's, it's a very simple model. Uh, that's essentially how I think this, this works. I don't know if should we stop there and if somebody has questions. I take a little break and I'll let people let this sink in and see if you have any questions. Because this is really important. This is my call to you guys. I want everybody to be doing this, you know? So. And I think everyone in the room is here because they resonate with this model. And okay. I'm watching both the chat room and the hands going up. I'm waiting okay. for them to go up. But I mean, and then a little bit about uh, uh, so, so why it works. So, so I think it works. I mean, it is definitely relevant because I mean, like I said, you kind of start with the fact that it, it's what does relevance mean? It's not, I think I said it. It means that it's somebody who cares deeply about it, right? So by definition, it is relevant. You think it's really relevant because you care so much about it, right? So it's by definition, this would be relevant. It might just be, be, be to you, but human beings are not that different. So I'm pretty sure if it's relevant to you, it's going to be relevant to a lot of other people. Here's another thing that I think is important. And I've noticed this with, in myself. 
I think your engagement shows and it creates an emotional connection with others. And like I said, I think that's what's missing in most research. I think it's like um, if you talk about your own story and link your own story, you put yourself as an individual out there. And I know you've been calling for that kind of research for your special issue. Uh, I think that just creates a deeper level of connection that's so important. Um, and here comes the other thing. I've been asked people saying, Johan, you're a full professor. Of course you can do that. But I mean, can you really ask for a, a junior scholar to do this? And I would say, I think it's more important if you're a junior scholar because it's, I, I think it's so important that you work hard. I had a PhD student who said, he said, it's easy to be a PhD student. The only thing you need to know is that you work 50 hours per week and you love it. And I think it's true. You need to work hard, but it's easy to work hard if you're really motivated, right? So I think it's, I think it's, um, that's an advantage. And here comes probably potentially the most important. You have unique insights and perspectives, both through maybe your own lived experience, but let's take cycling and, and Greg Fisher. I mean, he's been a cyclist for, for 20 years, 30 years. I mean, he's been, he knows so much about the actual context of riding a bicycle and the challenges you have on a multi-day uh, ride that, you know, it takes years and years to actually do this to get the level of knowledge. And I mean, if you have um, some kind of disability, uh, I mean, you you have unique insights that nobody who doesn't have a disability knows anything about. So I think that we can have just these unique insights and perspectives through li li lived experience that are invaluable. So we have a head start on, on anybody else who's interested. And then final listing, I think it's also relevant because uh, we want to tell everybody everywhere. I said I've given probably 100 presentations by now. <laughs> and like I said, it's because I think it's important. I love to talk about it. If you had asked me to come and talk about French capital today, I wouldn't have done it because it's, I mean, it's nothing I really care deeply about. So this is what this is why I think it works as kind of an approach to research and also an approach to be relevant. But I mean, there I also think there are challenges with this that, that I want to say a few words about. I mean, it, I think it it is difficult to balance the personal with the uh, universal here. And I think that when when you said this, Alex, you know what, what's a pushback? Uh, we've been getting I think we've been getting pushback from like mainstream people working with mainstream theories. And I think in part, it's been that I've had a challenge myself uh, to kind of go from the personal to the universal. But that's also why I, I started off by writing a conceptual paper, almost the first thing I did, because I wanted to be able to talk about these things at a more universal level. But it is a challenge, there's no doubt. Um, uh, so I think I, I have a couple of suggestions here. Uh, I, I, it's also this thing about, you know, your young lived experience, abstracting from what's unique uh, to what's general. But I think that's, it's not that different from the challenges that we have if we do a single case study. You know, if you, you do a single case study, it's like, and I, I desk reject a lot of single case studies in ATP. And the question I usually ask when I, or it's, the question or what I state is, uh, why, um, how is this different from what a journalist would write? You know, I think journalists are really good at just writing up. This is an interesting case. They can evoke emotion. They can explain. But if we're only talking about the data, only what's happening in the case, uh, that's not good research that would be published in a good journal. We need to be able to abstract uh, from that to talk about the more uh, general and so forth. And I think the challenge is, is the same. And therefore, I also think we can learn um, from if we have conducted single case studies, so we can just read, you know, there's a lot of people written about this. I mean, let's say uh, I, Kathy Eisenhardt, as an example, she's done that already since the 1980s. So I think when we think about doing this media search, I think we can use insight from this uh, uh, literature on single case studies. 
to understand how we can uh, make the most of this research. Does that make sense? Am I making myself clear there? Yeah. And then, of course, we need to find these connections to mainstream theories and research. And whether that is challenging these mainstream theories or kind of expanding on them, I mean, I don't think that matters necessarily, but we need to, we just need to argue that we're, we're able to contribute to the more mainstream uh, conversations that are taking place. I think that's extremely important, by the way. I can't emphasize that that much enough because otherwise I think that we risk being this kind of small corner of our field that nobody really cares about. I think there are other important areas of our field that are suffering from that uh, problem. I mean, I've been working very hard, for example, in ETP with one of my editors called Rob Nason. It's it's about what's called sometimes developmental entrepreneurship, but it's it's, it's an entrepreneurship in, in poor and developing areas of the world where uh, it hasn't really had the impact on mainstream research as we were hoping for. So we had that conversation as recently as yesterday. But anyway, we, we, we need to do this. Otherwise, we will never be fully legitimate as a, as a field. So then in terms of, of, of methods, I think that, I mean, I said I started off by interviewing people. I think it's, there's, it, it comes easiest to do inductive research. Maybe, you know, like Greg, you even, you even observe your own experiences or you talk to people that are similar to yourselves about their experiences. So it's, I think it's e easy to start with inductive research. I think it's fine. You can do inductive research through your whole career and you can be very successful. Um, but I think it might be worthwhile to start thinking about more traditional hypothesis testing research down the line. It's also a matter somewhat of, of, of legitimacy. I don't think everybody has to do this, but if we think about ourselves more as building a field, I think I don't think we can be successful building a field if we only do inductive research. I think that's a logical place to start and some can stay there, but we also need some people to go into the more developing and testing hypothesis. Yeah. Any thoughts there? I, um, while everyone else is, oh, yeah, hang on. I've just seen a hand. So, um, Marishka. Marishka. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Marishka, off you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so this is, this is, uh, this is great. Um, uh, second, second year P PhD, if that's, if that's helpful. Um, yeah. so filling, you um, mean PhD student. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Thank you. Um, uh, so feeling very um, inspired by by the the, the me search and having a, a language and um, inspiration to to defend that and you know channel my my work in in that way and um, feeling comfortable with picking up the skills of positioning a study and the conversation. Um, what I'm what I'm still feeling very frustrated with and underdeveloped with um, is in, in impact statements. I'm wondering if maybe you can speak to that, looking for models and papers and, and still feeling very underwhelmed but with sometimes a token given to in, impact. Now with in research papers, there's not really enough room. So there's, you know, that's part of, a, of an issue. But um, this one thing- Just I understand, uh, I think it's a great, uh, but. Are you talking about that our research does not have sufficient impact on the real world? Is that what you're saying? Um, I, no, the the development of impact in the in the paper. So typically towards the towards the end, um, where there might be given more attention to theoretical impact. Yes. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Policy. It's kind of a a token. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Of course. That's what I've been doing myself. Unfortunately, most of my career. So I, I know what you're talking. About. <laughs> 
I, I think that my second last point there is just finding the connections to mainstream theories and research. I think that's so important that you're able to, um, if, if we don't do that, I think our research will be frowned upon. You know, I think it's, I, I can only speak for myself. I think what I've, what I have tried to tackle now more recently is to get into this more current vibrant debate about uh, entrepreneurship action theory. I mean, but that's taking me close to a decade before I'm there. And I'm also kind of trying to get it into the mainstream. We're working on a paper we want to submit to, it's called Review in Clinical Psychology, which is like as an impact factor or 20, which is a top journal in clinical psychology. That's also to kind of connect with the mainstream research in clinical psychology. Again, and that's taking a, that's taken a decade. So I just don't think there's any, I mean, I think we have to, it, I mean, the reason I haven't done it, the reason why others have had hard time is because it's truly difficult. But I think that, I think we need to kind of have the open eyes to, but I think it becomes our research can be really become really really important when we do that. I think we just have to have have more workshops, more special issues, more for fora forums where we can discuss these issues and also try to. This is something that I think I'd be more successful with, to be honest, uh, to get more of the mainstream people interested and on board. And I'll be honest, let me be more frank than I should be probably. I organize these workshops outside my summer house in the south of Sweden. And if you invite people from, let's say, uh, Singapore or other places and tell them, we can pay for a ticket. You can come out uh, to the beautiful coast of southern Sweden and spend a weekend. We will do some work, but we will also have a lot of nice things going on mountain biking tours and eat some good food. I mean, it's a bit, you can call it a bribe if you wish, but it's been a really good way of getting mainstream people to um, to say, yeah, that sounds interesting. And then once they start talking to us, they can see we're pretty smart and, and pretty good scholars. And that kind of convinces them to get on board. Thank you. I'm not sure after what extent that was what you were after. <laughs> I think it's, um, I, I, I think you offered a lot of, a lot of good, um, uh, feedback and I'm going to take the party one and run. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think yeah. it's a great suggestion. <laughs> no, but, yeah. It, it is, um, I mean, I remember when, for example, I remember gender and entrepreneurship it was very much the same way where it was like nobody with a serious interest in, in research, uh, and wanted a serious career in, in, in entrepreneurship as a scholar did gender and entrepreneurship. It was like this really something on the fringes. And then for me, it was very much the Diana group with uh, 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 Candy Brush and Myra Hart and those people that kind of took that to the mainstream. And they did it actually through talking a lot about issues such as venture capital and other things that, and, and then more and more people came on board, more good scholars that were able to link this to more mainstream debate. So I think it's it's been done. I think we can go back and look in other areas that started on the fringes and see what they did and be able to take it more to the mainstream. But I think we, we can't do that unless we connect to the mainstream theories or research. We have to do that and it's hard. I guess that's my bottom line. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is what I think are the three important things, and I think this is what you guys are doing, right? Uh, we need to create a community of like-minded. We need to build some infrastructure with journals and workshops and stuff, and we need to seek legitimacy by getting our papers into the best journals, by getting the best journals to actually want to um, run special issues and so forth. So I think that's... Uh, and I think for it's, I'm talking to you, uh, Maria Shkishka, as a second year PhD student seriously, I know it's hard for you to, to, to take the initiative of, of, you know, proposing a special issue, but you need to think about these things. You need to be part of this. Or maybe it's by working together with Oana and Annika. I mean, as a PhD student, you know, you can't front things, but you can do a lot of the work behind the scenes. So 
uh, I think it's something we should think about already from the early part of our careers that because once we have these things, uh, our research will be very legitimate. Uh, legitimate. It's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. These these are the things I said. Um, or they said find the like-minded, organize the workshops, organize special issues, engage scholars from outside the fields, leaders within the fields, and young scholars, and give talks. I build databases. I think is also very important. Because if we did build, build databases, a lot of people are very data driven. They are only interested in coming to a field and do research. If, if you, they, we can point and say, well, there's actually high quality data you can work with. And uh, so that's something that we should also think about. That's good. It, it makes it easier to, to build a bigger, bigger um, uh, yeah, group. Annika? Um, yeah. Johan, one of the things I was um, wondering, because I'm still learning in that area as well, you've already talked quite a bit about working with clinical psychologists who, of course, have very different training, very different disciplinary views, even down to the ontologies and epistemologies and everything. So could you talk a bit more about how you also sort of, in addition to bringing a sort of fringe topic to the entrepreneurship world, also sort of working um yes. with people completely outside of the management research yes. world i can talk about three people i mean i can talk about this guy kevin that i uh, uh the person i i, I sent an email and asked if he if i could take him to lunch uh he's published in amp so so what i did with him and the others has been i invited him to a workshop it was in Syracuse, but it was one of those nice things. And we did went, I uh, did a wine tasting and a lot of other things. We had a really good time. And then I asked him to write a paper for that special issue in AMP. <clears throat> and then I was not the editor. AMP, they have a special format. Special issues is actually the, the journal itself that is, are the editors for the paper. But I actually pre-edited his paper. So, you know, he, he wrote up a paper and sent it to me and I said, this is this is not a paper for our journals. This is a paper for your journal. It won't never it will never make it into our journal. So I, I actually helped him rewrite the paper. So it's a bit of work, but um he, he was happy to uh he was happy to do that. And then uh, we did the same thing. We've written three uh, yeah, I'll be honest. I mean the other papers we have we have two more papers together now. They've also been in the manage, and I've done most of the work. So he's been like a fourth, fifth author on those papers. Where he, he I mean, he's contributed, but it's been, I kind of lured him in a little bit at a time. Is this an, is this an answer to your question? Yes. And, and how, um, trying to figure out how to ask this, but you, you know, how also we speak such different languages. I myself, I'm in a consortium where I'm the only social scientist and, you know, it took us a while to figure out how to talk yeah. to each other and know what we were talking about. So, so how do you deal with, with those interdisciplinary challenges as well? Yeah, I mean, in, in, yeah. So, but in this, in this case, when we have, have aimed for the management, let's just call it the management literature, uh, He's written a single author piece for AMP. In that case, I was kind of a pre-editor, okay? So I helped him to, to I actually, I was like more of a copy editor always. I was like, to move these sections around, delete this part. You have to write more about that, those kinds of things. Uh, like you would do with an early PhD student, potentially. The other two papers I have kind of written or my PhD student in one case wrote most of it. And then he has contributed, you know, uh, smaller pieces. But the per paper we're working on now is for this called uh, Clinical Psychology Review. Now he's the lead author instead. So he's the lead author, I'm the second author, my PhD student is the third author, and then his PhD student is the fourth author. And they mainly just do the, the actual review. But uh, we have decided to do it that way. So he's going to lead. He knows better how to how to write for that uh, audience. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, but it is it is truly. I mean, 
I actually, if, if I if I get to the, the third section on my on my presentation, it it is actually exactly about that paper, because it, it's it's so interesting how different their science is. But I also think we have so much to offer to the to the clinical psychology um, uh, field, actually. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, this is just me. Yeah, well, I already said most of this, but I think it, I find it actually very important to engage with the media. And it's it's really interesting because this is something which has been very important for my dean <laughs> and the school. It's like they think it's so mean. I'm great if I get a published paper in JDB. I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. But it, not everybody at the university cares. But if, if they write about my research in the Wall Street Journal, that has much more impact on a lot of people. So I've come to realize that that's actually really, really important to get legitimacy for, for what I do. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Yes. Um, if there was somebody who was uh, wanting to go before me, I don't know. No, no, you can, you can, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. just trying to figure out who's talking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Thank you for uh, your presentation, Johan. And um, uh, I am an assistant professor of human resource development at Oakland University in Michigan. Uh, so my discipline, um, as you can tell, is under the field of education, typically has in the School of Education. Yeah. So I bring a, a learning and development perspective on yeah. management studies. And so to pi piggyback on Anika's uh, question, so my question to you is, uh, what, what advice would you give to a faculty member who wants to contribute to um, uh, management organization, top, top uh, business journals? Uh, uh, our field, right, um, you know, study similar things, but of course there's uh, academic boundaries and so um, like you mentioned about your experience with the clinical psychologist, um, you know, that person may know much about how to publish in those uh, journals, but, uh, so what advice would you give to someone like a junior faculty outside the traditional field of management, yeah. wanting to contribute to the field of management? What advice would you give to those people in reaching out to like a getting a men mentorship from a person like you, like in terms of, yeah. you know, even though we are not a PhD student, but like no. how, how could we present ourselves, right, uh, in, in building that kind of mentor relationship? Uh, that's, it's a great and difficult question, but um, I might start in, um, I'll start in two different answers. So I do actually work with somebody at our School of Education. Uh, uh, she's a professor because one of the, my projects is to develop uh, education in entrepreneurship for students with ADHD. So let's assume, I don't know what you're interested in, let's, let's assume it's, it's something similar. I think that that's a very good way for somebody with your background to be able to contribute to actually, because like I said before, I think it's necessary that we take our insights so let's say we're doing something with disability and entrepreneurship. Let's assume that's a, I know that's a focus of this particular conference. If, if, if An Annika or, or Juan or somebody else wants to implement that kind of education, I think that you could be a great person to, uh, uh, to work with there. And she's also involved. We're also developing a game. Uh, it's a, and it's an entrepreneurship uh, game, uh, focusing on um, neurodiverse individuals and and entrepreneurship so she's involved in that that as well so so I'm, I'm, I'm working with those people and that uh that seems to work out well I think she's she's happy I think the work that she does is recognized within her school but I mean the difference between her and you is that she's a full professor so given that you're only two years into your career I'm, I'm thinking you will be up for tenure and three-year year review and then ten years, I'm thinking you have to make sure that you publish in the type of research and in the outlets that count at your school. And I'm also the chair of our promotion and tenure at my own school. And we've had six cases this year. So I know how, how important that is. We have people that, you know, go somewhat outside of 
the mainstream and publishing journals that are not that well recognized at our school and they run into problems if they do. So I would be a little bit careful if I were you to go wholeheartedly into publishing in management journals. I would definitely check with the senior people at your department and at your school to see which which journals are appreciated and which are not appreciated because you might you might do great work in great journals, but people are going to say, we have no idea what this is. This doesn't count here. Um, but, but, but if you do the things I was saying, where you actually link these insights about disability uh, to more things that happen in the classroom, you should be able to publish in those journals. Am I at all addressing your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for that. And I, I'd love to, you know, uh, continue this kind of conversation, um, you know, outside the conference, if I can. No, no, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. If, if you're interested in education research linking to, uh, you know, so, so the reason I'm talking so much about ADHD is also because my friend Melissa, who's at the School of Education, she and I speak about neurodiversity, but Kevin, who's a clinical psychologist, he says, I only know ADHD. If we do ADHD, I'm in. If you're going to do anything else, I'm out. So that's why it's been so focused because he's like a clinical psychologist. I know one thing. So uh, our education could be more generally focused on on neurodiversity, just so you know that if you have have an interest in that. Uh, but I'd be happy to talk to you outside of this conference. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, how do you know if, 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 if your research is relevant? And I think this is the best thing. Um, I think if we want to know if our research is relevant, it's, it's the simplest thing in the world. You talk about it with your friends and your family. Are they enthusiastic about what you do? You talk about it. I mean, your research is social gatherings. I mean, it happens in this country, and I guess most countries, if you meet people you never met before, the first thing they're going to ask is, what, what, what's your line of work? And they say, well, I'm a scholar. And what do you teach? And they say, well, I'll teach, but I also do research. And then they ask, what do you, re do, you do research about? And if you tell them, and they're like, really? Hmm. And then they want to start talking about something else, you realize, it might not, might not be the most interesting and relevant research. But if they say, wow, that's cool, you know that you're probably onto something. I think, I actually believe, honestly, these are the best indicators to know if you're doing relevant research. And then you talk to your research, in my case, with entrepreneurs. Do they think it's relevant and interesting? And if not, it probably isn't, right? And then finally, you talk about it in the classroom. What do your students say? So for me, these are like my four audiences when I test, is my research relevant or is it not relevant and if these seem to support it i'd say okay i'm i feel happy i feel confident that i'm doing re uh, relevant research so it's a it's an extremely extremely simple model but I, I actually do believe it's it's a pretty powerful way of thinking about it yeah i think this is my Okay, let's go to this then.